So, uh, good afternoon, Michelle. Thanks for coming to Radio Italia Una de And, uh, well, I, I've known, I spoke a little bit earlier about your background, but not much. So, I know, I've known about your work for several years now. Uh, maybe give us a bit of a brief history about your entrepreneurial journey, and then we'll talk into some of the issues that come up. Sure, yeah. sure. I was originally a medical research scientist, actually, with someone you know, Diana Salerno. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so I spent my early career, did a PhD through Department of Medicine, Adelaide University, and then spent around 10 years in the medical science space, looking at genetic markers that could predict, you know, um, leukemia prognosis or treatment response. So that was pretty interesting. Um, very basic research and um, yeah, really loved it. And then in 2007, I had a chance to start my own business actually with my husband. And that was using some really advanced technology called artificial intelligence, getting computers to do things that humans normally would do. And um, yeah, we grew that company together and worked all across the world um, in a whole range of different industries with a software product that could predict consumer behavior. And um, in around 2015, that, that business was bought by um, a large consulting firm, Ernst & Young. And then we moved on to our, our journey into AI and healthcare. Cool. Now, artificial intelligence, what, what does that mean? Artificial intelligence is really just getting computers to do what humans can do. Um, so in the case of what we're using it for now, we're using artificial intelligence to analyse pictures of embryos or babies in early in vitro fertilisation pregnancy um, to help pick which one is more healthy than another. Let's pursue there's two interesting things here. The IVF. IVF is an important topic. Um, then we'll see a bit how you use artificial intelligence for that person. So does it affect many people? Is it in Australia more popular, more used, more required than in other countries? No, it's a really, it's a global problem and it affects about one in six couples. So it's a huge issue and it's actually growing quite rapidly globally. So it's a big problem, not just here in Australia, but um, all around the world. And so you use a computer to decide which fetus do you call them fetus at that stage? They're they? an embryo, embryo at that stage. Yeah. It's it's what happens currently is that normally a um, when you when you go through in vitro fertilization you have embryos cultured in a dish instead of in the human body okay. and then that very early stage embryo gets transferred back into the patient to create the baby. Um, and a clinician needs to look at those embryos and pick which one they think is healthy and will result in a pregnancy for the patient. And that's quite challenging for them. So we have a computer program that can help analyse images of those embryos to pick the best one. So for this, you must need some sort of history of knowing which embryos then are more likely to be successful, quote unquote. Um, exactly. And where do you get that? So we worked with international clinics all around the world and they had a collection of images of embryos and they knew whether or not those embryos resulted in a pregnancy for the patients. And we used that essentially to train the AI um, so that it becomes very clever at being able to predict for a new image that it's never seen before. Now, you talked about international collaborations already, and I've seen, what was the name of your company? Presogen. Presogen. Yeah. And then your current company? Presogen is the company, and Life Whisperer is the product. That's oh, the fertility Life product. Whisperer. Yeah, I'm, I'm just intrigued by this name. Yes, yes. Where, where did you get the name from? It's beautiful. I didn't come up with it. Um, one of our co-founders, Jonathan Hall, he came up with the idea when he was at university, actually. And um, I was mentoring him through a commercial commercialization program. And he had called his project Life Whisperer. And so we kept the name once we started the company and joined forces to solve this problem. So I, I think it's got a lovely, lovely connotation. 
the whisper whispering life into uh, someone's um, existence, which up here. Now, going back to the international collaborations, I know you've uh, you've had some very recently. You've been to the United States. You've had something happen in India. In fact, we've been trying to get together for this interview for maybe a year or more. Apologies. <laughs> no, that's right. No, that is wonderful to see that you're you're so busy. So tell us a little bit about the internationalisation. Yeah, we've yeah. got a we've got a global first approach as a company, and I think that's quite rare coming from Australia. But this type of technology can work anywhere in the world if you build it right, and I think that's the value. And it's all based on cloud service delivery. So we can we can set up a clinic using our software within minutes anywhere in the world. And that's the really exciting thing about this type of technology. Global first, not born global, global first. Global okay. first. What I mean by that is that in order for these technologies to scale to different global clinics, you need to build it from global data and you need to already be thinking about how you're going to um, provide this service for clinics globally. And is it different? How have you found it different going to different countries? The United States and India, for example, they seem very different to me. They are very different, um, but the need is the same. So it's, it's quite interesting because every different market is very different in the way that the technology applies. So although we're creating new life and helping um, helping people get greater success through IVF, doesn't matter where we are in the world, um, in India, for example, we're helping provide a skill using the computer software that is hard to come by in that location. Whereas in the US, they're quite technologically advanced. And so for the US clinics, it's about using the latest in technology to help improve outcomes. So the value is different for each of those different regions, but the ultimate outcome is we're there to help them get patients pregnant quicker during the IVF process. So, okay, you're helping the people in India achieve access to a technology and the Americans probably to use the technology to its fullest. So it sounds like you're actually paying attention to what the market wants. And that, in my experience, both in uh, research and education, is not obvious for someone who comes from a research or technology no. background. The idea tends to be, we're a researcher or a scientist, we have to produce another discovery or a perfect technology. Is that true? Is that how 